bicarbonate. Now, our bicarbonate in the bloodstream is about 24, is a normal serum bicarbonate, and that's a small molecule that's freely filtered, and all of that needs to get reabsorbed. If you don't reabsorb that, usually it's an altered set point for bicarbonate reabsorption, uh, then you start dumping bicarbonate. And as you acutely go into a proximal RTA, you will have a high urinary pH and you will have bicarbonate in your urine because you're dumping that bicarbonate. But generally, you only dump the bicarbonate down to a certain level, 16, 18, whatever the set point is for bicarbonate reabsorption. And then once you get there, your body is able to reabsorb. Your serum bicarb is 18, and you're reabsorbing all of that bicarb. And so again, you're acidifying your urine. Proximal RTA, you can acidify your urine. You're just dumping bicarbonate. Much harder to treat because you have to give them lots and lots of bicarbonate because you give them bicarb and their body reabsorbs 16 or 18 and it dumps the rest. And so treating distal RTA, you only have to give enough to take care of the titratable acids. Treating proximal RTA, you have to try to overwhelm the kidneys dumping of bicarbonate. Um, there are a couple of sort of classic etiologies of uh, proximal RTA. There are some isolated familial forms. Uh, it's also an idiopathic Fanconi syndrome. And then there are a number of secondary forms, acquired toxins like heavy metal toxins. Uh, the most common that, that we see on board exams these days is iphosphamide. Uh, uh, primary treatment of choice these days for a lot of the pediatric bone tumors. Um, and it is a proximal tubular killer. Um, it's also a, a uh, tumor killer, so I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. Um, but if you give enough ifosamide, you can poison those proximal tubule cells. And so they get a uh, Fanconi syndrome, uh, which is not only dumping of bicarbonate, but all of the other things that the proximal tubule is supposed to do. So they dump amino acids, they dump glucose, et cetera. Uh, there uh, are acquired conditions like amyloid and multiple myeloma, not generally pediatric conditions, but those can present with proximal RTAs. Uh, and then finally, there are some metabolic disorders, low syndrome, Wilson's galactosemia, et cetera. Uh, distal RTA, there's an autosomal dominant form of distal RTA. Uh, uh, they get, uh, it's an alpha intercalated cell uh, defect. There's an autosomal recessive form of uh, distal RTA that comes with sensory neural hearing loss. Um, there are a bunch of, and again, I'm not going to repeat them because they're on here and we're trying to, to get home, uh, but there are a bunch of acquired forms of distal RTA as well. In renal transplant patients, they get it from either tubular injury, from uh, medication. Patients with sickle cell disorder will have uh, distal RTA. Um, nephrocalcinosis, which is a distal calcium deposition problem, will get distal RTAs. Uh, let me give you another case. 12-month-old presents with severe dehydration and poor growth. He's been an avid formula drinker, but eats solids poorly. Family history is negative for renal disease. Lab studies reveal a sodium of 159, a potassium of 3.8, a bicarbonate of 16, chloride of 99, normal BUN and creatinine, urine, specific gravity 1005, pH of 5.5. The most likely cause of his metabolic acidosis is? Forty-six percent of you got nephrogenic DIA. It comes in with a sodium of 160 almost, very dilute-making urine. Uh, that's another one of these tubular uh, defects. Um, and again, nephrogenic DIA, usually a distal tubular problem. Um, all right, a 12-year-old girl has poor growth and recurrent kidney stones. Bone distance exam reveals diminished bone mass. She's now noted to have the following lab studies. Small blood, but no other findings on dipstick. The most likely cause of her metabolic acidosis, bicarb is 16. All right, let you guys think about that one. Something about acid-based disorders. We're back down to only 20, 30 people responding. Um, yeah, this one is a distal RTA. Um, all right, it's not really a tubular thing. Um, but in the section on tubules, I thought I would throw this in. Um, a lot of board exams, for whatever reason, like to ask about the mechanism of action. I think it's just to make sure that you weren't sleeping during pharmacology class. 
Uh, and so the renal ones that they always ask about, if they ask at all, are about the diuretics. What is the mechanism of action of this diuretic? Acetazolamide is a proximal tubular uh, uh, medication. It's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It blocks that intracellular hydrogen. And so you get a metabolic acidosis from that. Uh, Lasix or furosemide and ethocrinic acid are loop diuretics. They block the NKCC pump. Uh, you get hypochloremia, hyponatremia, and hypokalemia. Again, you're dumping those things because you're blocking the pump to reabsorb them. Thiazide diuretics act in the distal convoluted tubule. They block sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule. Although it's not a major place, uh, it is, as I told you, about 10% uh, of the sodium and, and uh, water get reabsorbed there. So you can get hyponatremia, you can get hypokalemia. And then finally, spironolactone is the classic uh, potassium sparing diuretic. It is an aldosterone blocker. Um, uh, there's also a plerinone, which is a uh, specific aldosterone blocker. Works in the distal tubule. You get hyperkalemia, as you would expect from a uh, potassium sparing diuretic. Um, we spent a lot of time earlier this morning talking about glomerular diseases, um, but the kidney is not just made up of the glomerulus. There are also a lot of tubular diseases and diseases that affect the other parts of the nephron, the tubes and the interstitium. Um, unlike the glomerular diseases that present with hematuria and proteinuria and active urinary sediments, classically the tubular diseases present with dilute urine, so you lose the concentrating defect. That's a tubular function. Um, minimal hematuria, if any proteinuria, it's mild, and it may be tubular proteinuria. So this is one where they may actually not even dipstick positive for protein because the dipstick's looking for albumin, but they will have, if you check with sulfasilic acid, protein there. Um, uh, but it's a tubular proteinuria. Sterile pyuria, so white cells without uh, bacteria there. Uh, normal blood pressure, maybe some mild blood pressure problems. But even though they're not glomerular diseases, they can present with renal uh, dysfunction, renal insufficiency. Uh, interstitial nephritis, uh, etiology, classically drugs, uh, uh, medications, uh, penicillin, cephalosporins, Bactrim, Rifampin, cimetidine, the thiazide diuretics, uh, carbamazepine, allopurinol, uh, and dilantin. Um, drug toxicity from NSAIDs can cause an interstitial nephritis, although that usually causes more nephrosis, nephrotic syndrome, uh, from uh, uh, NSAIDs. Sarcoidosis and lupus can present, uh, although with glomerular diseases, also with interstitial diseases. Pyelonephritis uh, is not a glomerular disease in the kidney. It's generally an interstitial disease. Uh, and finally, transplant rejection usually doesn't a affect the glomerulus. You see a lot of interstitial infiltrate with transplant rejection. Chronic interstitial nephritis you get from urinary tract obstruction. If you obstruct the urine for long enough, the urine hanging out in the tubules will cause an immune reaction and uh, will lead to an interstitial nephritis. There are drugs like chronic analgesia use or cisplatin or cyclosporin that lead to an interstitial nephritis. That's one of the problems. It's a great for transplant, and we'll talk about transplant in a few minutes. Uh, it's been a wonderful medication that's helped us transplant many more people than we otherwise would have been able to transplant. But the very drug that we use to prevent rejection causes interstitial nephritis and a chronic uh, inflammation of the interstitium. Uh, Sjogren's syndrome, heavy metal intoxication, lead, uh, cadmium, and uh, mercury. They're hard to remember because those don't look like lead, cadmium, or mercury, but that's what the uh, symbols are. The other reason you had to take chemistry as a pre-med requirement. Uh, clinically, they present with an unexpected increase in serum creatinine. People look relatively fine, but their creatinine's elevated. They may have some mild proteinuria, glycosuria, uh, but no evidence of edema or hypertension like you would see with one of the glomerular diseases. Tubular toxins to the proximal tubule. I already mentioned ifosfamide. Uh, but certainly aminoglycosides and amphotericin, we know they cause acute renal failure. They do it not by causing glomerular injury, but by causing proximal tubular injury. And then the heavy metals I already mentioned, but this time I don't have to remember what they stand for because I wrote it out here. Tubular disorders I mentioned when we were talking about uh, the tubular function, Fanconi's uh, syndrome, 
It's a proximal RTA. They have a proximal tubular injury. So they also have glycosuria. They have hypophosphatemia because they're wasting phosphorus. This would be one of those conditions where you would want to measure that uh, tubular reabsorption of phosphorus. They have amino aciduria, so they're losing amino acids in their urine as well. It can be a primary process as part of a proximal RTA, uh, but more commonly we see it as a secondary cause. Again, these days ifosamide is the one that I think you'll probably be asked on. I can't guarantee that, but that would be my guess. Oxalosis is a tubular disorder uh, that's caused by a, a gamma GLT deficiency. They can't convert oxalate to a harmless metabolite, so oxalate builds up. It doesn't only build up in the kidney tubules, it also builds up in the heart and vasculature, but uh, what they essentially get is renal failure during infancy, uh, that as they progress, more and more of this oxalate gets deposited in the kidney, and they essentially petrify their kidneys. Their kidneys become calcium oxalate stones. Um, they will develop ESRD, and they get oxalate deposits not only in their kidneys, but in their bone and other organs as well. Uh, cystinosis is a tubular disorder uh, that has proximal tubular injury. It's often a Fanconi type picture, uh, but they will also have progressive uh, kidney disease uh, that goes to ESRD. They get cysteine crystals in the retina, so in the eye, in the bone marrow, so they're pancytopenic, and also uh, in the conduction system in the heart, so they get arrhythmias. Uh, it's autosomal recessive. They can't shuttle cysteine from the intracellular vesicles, so they don't get processed appropriately, so they get these intracellular crystals of cysteine. Um, and again, it's a proximal tubular uh, injury. Uh, you can now give cysteamine, or there's a, a cystagon, which is a treatment for it, water and solute replacement, because they do have loss of all those uh, things that the proximal tubule normally reabsorbs for us. Prognosis, if you catch it early enough and treat them, you, they can do relatively well, although often they present late, and so it depends on how much uh, damage has already occurred. A 10-month-old girl comes in with failure to thrive during a visit for wheezing. She's a good eater, no past medical problems. Her blood pressure is 86 over 60 with moderate dehydration but no other abnormalities. Those are her lab studies, and again, I think you have this on your uh, form there, so I won't repeat the labs. The most likely cause of her failure to thrive is? Fifty-three people say Fanconi syndrome. Yeah, this is our recurring theme. I should just stand behind you and present stuff right before you take the board exams because you do better after I've presented the material on getting the questions. All right, a five-month-old, a 15-month-old, excuse me, is evaluated for abdominal pain and vomiting, noted to have a UA with two-plus blood, one-plus protein, and an otherwise negative dipstick. Abdominal film revealed multiple stones in the collecting system and in the renal parenchyma of both kidneys. The most likely cause of her bilateral stones is? Oxalosis. We may be, this may be the closest we get to a consensus in this group. Um, a 16-year-old girl had recent vomiting and poor energy. She had no fever or rash. Her past medical history is possible for augmentin. She's taken for sinusitis in the last month. And she occasionally takes ibuprofen for muscle uh, pain because she's on the track team. Her labs show a sodium of 133, a potassium of 3.9, bicarbonate of only 19, chloride of 109, creatinine 1.9, the N of 18. She's got a dilute urine with a pH of 6.5 with some blood, some protein, and some leukesterase. There are eosinophils noted on her urine. Uh, I read all that. That's one of the things. How many people are recertifying and how many people are certifying for the first time? First time certifiers? So what you're going to notice on the pediatric boards, they're going to be really long clinical cases. And I assume you went over all this about sort of test taking strategies. but. But they give you a lot of information, and so some of it's useful and some of it's not, and you've got to weed out what's important. Um, and, and most of taking the exam is a, uh, it's like a track meet. You've just got to keep up with it. It's a marathon, reading the, the cases. Yeah, so this kid, that was even more. It was 100%, right? Acute uh, tubular interstitial nephritis. All right, let's leave uh, tubular disorders and talk about hypertension. Um, I, I will warn you, uh, I could talk for the next hour and a half about hypertension, but I won't because, frankly, it's not really asked about as much as it should be on the board exams. Uh, when you look at the ABP content outline, uh, 
What you need to know about hypertension is general about how we define it and what it is. The renal stuff, the vascular stuff, uh, adrenal, and some of the miscellaneous causes. Uh, the definition of hypertension in children is an average systolic or diastolic greater than the 95th percentile for age, height, and gender on three or more occasions. And so normal blood pressure for a child is less than the 90th percentile, or when kids get to be about 12 or 13 years old, the 90th percentile actually is higher than 120 over 80. And for you and I and everyone else in the room, for adults, 120 over 80 is the high end of normal. Between 120 and 140, we're prehypertensive. Kids are the same. So it's the 90th percentile or less than 120 over 80 is normal. And then prehypertension is from 120 over 80 or the 90th percentile up to the 95th percentile. Uh, and then hypertension, as I said, is at the 95th percentile or higher. Uh, blood pressure is on the rise in the United States. There have been a number of studies that have looked uh, that show that, uh, that the average systolic pressure of children uh, is rising. The prevalence of hypertension, depending on the populations you study, is anywhere from 4% to 19%. We've done a lot of studies at UT Houston where we go out into the schools and do school-based blood pressure screening, uh, and we found uh, hypertension prevalence is even higher than that. Uh, as high as 11% in some of the schools that we go to. Um, primary hypertension in childhood, um, and this is another one of these changing fields. 25 years ago, when people talked about pediatric hypertension, they would mostly talk about secondary hypertension. And it is still true that if you're talking about secondary hypertension, it is more common in kids than it is in adults. Um, but the most common type of hypertension in children now is not secondary hypertension. It's essential hypertension, and it's probably due to the epidemic of obesity that we're seeing. Uh, who should have their blood pressure checked? The uh, working group on high blood pressure, which is an NHLBI and a uh, 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 NIH panel that came out with these recommendations, say that all children over the age of three should have their blood pressure checked at routine doctor visits. When they come in to see us, we should be checking their blood pressure. Kids under the age of three, if they have any of these conditions, anyone who's been premature or spent time in the NICU, congenital heart disease, recurrent urinary tract or renal disease, family history of renal disease, solid organ transplant. So there are other kids even below the age of three who should have their blood pressure checked. Um, but everyone over the age of three should be having their blood pressure checked when they come in. Um, there are a number of secondary causes that you need to be familiar with for the board exam. Renal causes are the most common. We spent a lot of time talking about GNs this morning. Parenchymal renal disease of any kind can lead to hypertension. There are endocrine causes, and again, I hope that you covered this in your endocrine section, thyroid disease and Cushing syndrome. Tumors, the oncology section should have covered Wilms, neuroblastoma, and pheochromocytoma. Theochromocytoma is exceedingly rare in clinical practice and exceedingly common on board exams. Um, I, I don't know. That's another one of those things that they like to ask about kids who come in with flushing and, and sweaty palms and hypertension that's episodic, and that's a theochromocytoma on a board exam. In real life, it's probably just a nervous kid who's got essential hypertension. But in any case, vast. renal artery stenosis, because <laughs> all important blood flow is coming down to the kidney anyways, right? Uh, and then there are medications. Lots of kids on stimulant medications, which are great for ADHD, but also do raise the blood pressure. Beta agonists and uh, steroids are also common. Uh, and these are glucocorticoids as well as anabolic steroids that can lead to hypertension. Um, we think about childhood as a time when kids grow up. If you'll watch the screen, you'll see that unfortunately these days our kids are not growing up, they are growing out. When I was a kid, there may have been one or two obese kids in the grade. Um, these days, again, I go out into the schools, it is more the norm than not. Fully a third of children uh, in the United States are either overweight or frankly obese. Um, and it is the leading risk factor for hypertension in childhood now. Uh, when it comes to therapy, I do not think you will get any questions about therapy on your boards. I can't guarantee that. But the reason is, is because this is where we are. Um, you know, 
take a number. Uh, there have been no head-to-head -head comparisons. A huge explosion of research in pediatric hypertension in the last 15 years. The FDA Modernization Act of 1996 essentially put a carrot in front of the pharmaceutical companies and said, if you do a pediatric study and get a pediatric labeling for your drug, we will grant you an extension on your patent by six months. And so whereas before 1996, the, the market for pediatric hypertension drugs is very small compared to the adult market, 70 million of us have high blood pressure. Most pharmaceutical companies didn't do a pediatric study. It was expensive, it was time consuming, and there weren't that many patients who needed it. Well now, with an extra six months of patent exclusivity to sell to the 70 million adults with hypertension, all of the newer agents have now been studied. And so we have a huge number of drugs that we have pediatric labeling for, pediatric indications for, and pediatric dosing for. But unlike adults where we do all had and comparative studies, I, I can't tell you whether ACE inhibitors are better than calcium channel blockers or diuretics or beta block because no one's ever studied them head to head. So again, I don't think you'll be asked about them, um, but uh, just know that there are a lot. I'm not going to go through this algorithm. This also comes from the fourth working group report on uh, how to treat uh, blood pressure in children. Uh, the important thing is at the top there, measure blood pressure, measure height, and calculate a BMI for all of your patients that you're seeing in your clinical practice. Again, all of your patients over the age of three. Even if they're normotensive over on this side, educate them on a healthy lifestyle for heart, not only for the kid, but also for the family. Uh, I, I don't want to get on my soapbox too much about this, um, but as pediatricians, Hypertension is what's going to kill most of your patients. It's not going to kill them when they're your patients. It's going to kill them 40 and 50 years down the road. But cardiovascular disease is still the number one cause of death in the United States. And by far and away, it's due to high blood pressure. Stroke is the number three cause of death. By far and away, it's due to hypertension. So this is the disorder that's going to cause the most morbidity and mortality for your patients. It's just fortunately not going to cause it for your patients at their age. Although what we have found is that kids who present with hypertension, and when we confirm that they have hypertension on multiple occasions, and often we'll do an ambulatory blood pressure monitor to make sure that it's true hypertension and not white coat. Of those kids that we confirm with hypertension on ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, multiple studies are showing that these kids, about a third of them already have left ventricular hypertrophy, evidence of end organ damage from their high blood pressure. Uh, if it's a uh, stage one, you can do some of this workup on yourself. Look for target organ damage, including an echocardiogram. Look for the etiology uh, if you can find a secondary cause. Again, more common to find a secondary cause in pediatrics and think about those secondary causes that I listed there. But by and large, these days, again, for clinical practice, you're probably not going to find anything. Essential hypertension is the most common. The obesity epidemic may be the unfortunate iceberg of our medical careers. What we see is obese kids. What we're going to see in the future, uh, we will see it progress. The huge underpinnings, uh, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, blindness, and of course the granddaddy of them all, cardiovascular disease. All right, that's what I have. That's my soapbox about hypertension. Um, let's talk about acute kidney injury, dialysis, and transplantation. Um, acute renal failure is defined as the rapid decrease in GFR leading to an accumulation of nitrogenous wastes, elevated BUN and creatinine. There are three main types that you, there are lots of types, but we generally classify them as either pre-renal, intrinsic renal causes, or post-renal. Let's talk about pre-renal acute kidney injury or acute renal failure. Uh, the definition is a decrease in urine output and renal function due to diminished effective renal blood flow. The causes in pediatrics, uh, volume depletion, you either get decreased intravascular volume from true dehydration, from blood loss, from diuretic use, from burns where you're losing a lot more through your skin, uh, or from shock, you get third spacing out into your tissues and so your effective volume is down. Uh, or decreased uh, 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 intravascular volume and an expanded total body volume. So those edematous states where we have a lot of fluid, it's just not circulating. CHF or heart failure, cirrhosis, and nephrosis, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, decreased cardiac output and heart failure or with arrhythmias, if they're not circulating blood, will lead to a pre-renal acute kidney injury. 
Uh, and then finally, peripheral vasodilation. You've got enough fluid, but the vessels are all expanded, so there's not much circulating around. Septic shock, anaphylaxis, uh, vasodilatory drug. Uh, and then renal vasoconstriction. If you get a constriction of your renal vessels, then you're not getting much blood flow to the kidneys, and the kidneys will see that. Um, and so renal artery stenosis can lead to a pre-renal acute kidney injury, uh, as do ACE inhibitor use, um, sepsis, and hepatorenal syndrome. We'll skip intrinsic renal disease for a second because we've kind of been talking about intrinsic renal diseases for the last few hours. Let's talk about post-renal. There are some inherited or congenital post-renal obstructions that can lead to renal failure. Posterior urethral valves is the classic in boys. There are bladder abnormalities and UPJ or UVJ obstruction. The, the last section is going to be on urologic conditions, and we'll talk about those. And then there, there are acquired uh, post-renal causes like calculi, renal stones, clots, a neurogenic bladder where the, kidney, uh, the bladder is not cycling normally, and so you get a back pressure. Uh, and there are drugs that can cause urinary retention that uh, can also lead to a post-renal obstruction. Now, intrarenal acute kidney injury is often referred to as acute tubular necrosis because the tubules are actually becoming necrotic. Um, you get that from prolonged ischemia, from nephrotoxins, or from septic shock. Uh, the renovascular diseases, we talked about HUS, uh, some of the other vasculitides. Interstitial diseases like interstitial nephritis can present with an acute drop in GFR because of the interstitial disease, uh, infection or infiltration of the kidney. Um, and then finally, all the GNs that we talked about can lead to renal failure because of uh, uh, that's a true intrarenal uh, problem. And then intratubular obstruction, we're going to talk about stones in a few minutes, but urate nephropathy or oxalate uh, deposition, hypercalcemia, and then there are certain drugs like methotrexate that's cleared that can uh, cause intratubular uh, uh, deposition and, and cause uh, intrarenal problems. We talked early on in the day about the FENA. The FENA is used in acute kidney injury to help delineate and define where the, the likely cause is. With pre-renal, with volume depletion or ACE inhibitors, um, uh, you get a very low fractional excretion of sodium. You get a very low urinary sodium. Uh, and a very high urine osm. The urine is uh, very concentrated. Um, and on urinalysis, it's usually a pretty bland-looking urine with pre-renal. You may see a couple of granular casts, but not much other than that. With intrinsic renal disease, like ATN or septic shock, rhabdomyolysis, you'll get, as I mentioned, a high fena. The kidney tubules are unable to reabsorb those uh, sodium, uh, and so you get a high urinary sodium. Uh, and generally, what's referred to as isostonuria, which is just a fancy way of saying is what gets filtered is what comes out. The kidney is neither dilute nor is it concentrating. It's about the osm of serum. Your serum osm is about 300. Your urine osm is about 300. That's an, a renal, uh, the, re the, renal uh, the renal tissue has lost its ability to concentrate or to uh, dilute urine. Uh, with renal injury, you can see casts, you can see hematuria, you can see proteinuria. And then finally, with post-renal, with obstructive uh, acute kidney injury, um, the fena is usually normal. You have a normal urine sodium, so it's higher than 20, assuming you've got a normal diet and you're eating uh, sodium. Uh, your urine osm is usually very low. With post-obstructive, you usually make a very dilute urine. Uh, the intervention or the management of acute kidney injury, regardless of the cause, we try to hydrate these people, so saline boluses, uh, restore the effect of circulating volume, certainly for pre-renal failure. Um, we know that acute kidney injury carries a fairly large mortality with it. Uh, Stu Goldstein, who used to be at Baylor, he's now up in Cincinnati, has done a lot of work with the uh, uh, acute kidney injury network and uh, the registry of pediatric acute kidney injury. Um, we know that oliguric renal failure is worse than non-oliguric renal failure, so we try to get the kids peeing because it's easier to manage and they may do better if they're peeing than if they're not peeing. Diuretics, um, without uh, uh, maligning them too much, that's really a surgical answer. Uh, the surgeons don't like it when kids aren't peeing, so they give diuretics. You can make a kid pee with diuretics, but it doesn't change their GFR at all, so it has no effect on outcome. 
And if they're pre-renal and you give them diuretics, you can actually make things worse. And so if it makes you happy to see urine coming out, you can give diuretics. Certainly if they have pulmonary edema volume overload because of oliguria, making them pee is a good thing. But don't think that diuretics just, okay, now they're peeing. That doesn't, if you give volume and someone goes from non-oliguric or from oliguric to non-oliguric renal failure, you've probably improved things. You've improved the underlying pathophysiology. If you give them diuretics, that's not going to change their underlying pathophysiology. It may make you feel better, but it may not make the patient better. Uh, electrolyte therapy, obviously one of the problems we see with acute kidney injury is abnormal electrolytes. The one that we worry about the most is hyperkalemia um, because that can kill you. So we try to avoid early on any potassium-containing fluids. If you've got a kid on IV fluids and they develop acute renal injury, one of the first things that you should do is take the potassium out of their fluids until you're sure they're going to continue to make urine. Uh, it's one of those easy in, very hard out phenomenons. It's easy to give potassium. If their kidneys aren't working well, it's really hard to get the potassium back out. Um, if you need to acutely lower the potassium, um, the tricks of the trade that we have, right, so IV sodium bicarbonate, um, by uh, giving bicarbonate, you will pull hydrogen out of the cells, which will then drive potassium into the cells. So it doesn't actually help the hyperkalemia in terms of the total body potassium, but you can at least get it out of the bloodstream and into the cells. The same thing is true uh, with uh, uh, the insulin and glucose. Insulin drives potassiums intracellularly, so it doesn't actually change the total body potassium, but if you have hyperkalemia, you can shuttle it back into the cells. To get rid of potassium that's actually in the bloodstream, you need the kidneys to pee it out. You can give uh, kaexalate, which is a resin binder that will bind it in the gut and you'll poop it out, uh, or finally we can dialyze it off. Um, before I leave hyperkalemia, the one other thing I will say is you should also give IV calcium. IV calcium doesn't do anything to the potassium values. They stay just where they are. But what the calcium does is it stabilizes the cardiac membrane, and so it prevents the arrhythmias that you get with hyperkalemia. So that's another one of your mainstays. If someone has hyperkalemia, you give them calcium. It only works for about an hour or two, so you may have to keep redosing it. But we usually do all of those things. You give calcium, you give uh, kexalate, you give insulin and glucose and bicarb, and you know, start bringing the dialysis machine in if, in fact, their kidneys are completely shut down. There is no absolute... BUN or creatinine criteria for when to start dialysis and acute kidney injury. Some people would say, well, you want to keep the BUN under 100 because there are some older studies that show that people whose average BUN was less than 100 with acute renal injury did better than people whose BUN was over 100. That may be true. It may just be that the people whose BUN was over 100 were sicker, and that's why they didn't do as well. Uh, but some people would say that, that you know, a BUN over 100 is at least a soft indication. More and more these days, I think we're getting away from doing dialysis truly for an indication. I mean, certainly if the patient has hyperkalemia that you can't control or that has pulmonary edema that's not responsive to uh, diuretics, those are absolute indications that we need to do dialysis. More and more, I think we're using dialysis as renal replacement therapy. You and I have the benefit of a healthy functioning kidney. Someone who's sick in the hospital with kidney injury should have that benefit as well. And so we replace their renal function with dialysis. It allows us to give them more fluids uh, so we can keep nutrition going. That's one of the indications. And so, again, there's no absolute indication, but more and more people are not waiting for an indication. They're dialyzing for renal replacement therapy. Before we finish talking about acute kidney injury, there is a specific cause of acute kidney injury that we need to talk about. There are actually a few of them. Rhabdomyolysis is one of them. Myoglobin released from muscle breakdown, either from trauma, there are medications that can do it, hyperthermia. We're about to see rhabdomyolysis in Texas. Um, anybody know why? Football season. They're about to go out into the heat that's out there now and do two, and do two a day football practices. So within the next month, we're going to see at least two or three cases of kids who come in with rhabdo. It happens every August um, as these kids get into football. And so, uh, you know, keeping well hydrated and avoiding over-extremuous. Uh, but you, we diagnose this clinically, elevated CK levels, urine myoglobin, uh, blood in the dipstick, but not any blood or not much blood on microscopic exam. Um, and then frequently they come in with hypocalcemia, uh, 
hyperphosphatemia, hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia, and I mentioned earlier on that rhabdo is one of those causes where you get a creatinine that's higher than it should be for the level of renal dysfunction, and so you get actually a diminished BUN to creatinine ratio. The creatinine is higher than normal, and so you get a low BUN to creatinine ratio. The hypocalcemia is because of a low production of activated vitamin D as well as from the hyperphosphatemia. We vigorously uh, volume expand these patients. Some people still like to give IV bicarbonate to alkalinize the urine. Um, and some people, although I haven't seen it in a while, talk about a forced diuresis with mannitol. Usually just high IV fluids are enough to do this. Uh, malignancy is the other specific cause of acute renal failure that we need to talk about. Uh, you can get direct tumors into the kidney, uh, and I'm not talking about Wilms or renal cell carcinoma, but uh, leukemia can infiltrate into the kidney and cause uh, a, an infiltrative disease. You can also get obstruction, and we see this a lot uh, with lymphoma or with pelvic sarcomas uh, that are obstructing the, uh, uh, the urinary outflow. But the specific intrinsic renal disease that you'll get asked about on your board exams is tumor lysis syndrome. You get a rapid cell death from chemotherapy, and this is a good thing. We're trying, you know, we're in the business of killing cancer cells. The problem is if you kill too many cancer cells at once, all of that intracellular contents gets released into the bloodstream, and it overwhelms the kidney's ability to clear it. And so you get a an intratubular obstruction uh, with uh, cellular debris, which then leads to renal failure. Um, uh, the prevention of this is vigorous hydration. Um, part of what you get is uh, a hyperuricemia. Um, we are one of the only mammals around that doesn't have uricase or resburicase as an enzyme. Uh, most other animals don't have uric acid as a problem because they metabolize it down. Um, we can borrow from them. There is now a pharmaceutical agent of uricase. Uh, it's an amazing medication. You can go from a uric acid of 14 or 15 to undetectable in about four hours. Uh, it just melts the stuff away. Uh, and you can use that in rhabdomyolysis or in uh, tumor lysis syndrome. Uh, and then finally, supplemental calcium and early dialysis uh, to prevent further uh, uh, blockage of further tubules. All right, a 16-year-old girl with recent vomiting and poor energy. Oligiri complained of difficulty voiding over the last two days. Past medical history is negative. Her creatinine is 5.8. Blood pressure is 122 over 74, and her exam is unremarkable except for some mild dehydration. I show you her labs there. She's got some blood and protein in her urine with leukocyte esterase. The most likely cause of her renal insufficiency is... Sorry, I have to advance for you to answer. Most of you said pre-renal, but remember she had trouble voiding. She had trouble getting her urine out for a few days. So I would say this is probably a post-renal problem. Usually with pre-renal, you don't say, I can't get the urine out, I'm having a hard time. You just say, I'm not peeing, but not, I'm having difficulty getting the urine out. Uh, a nine-year-old girl presents with a three-day history of diarrhea with blood and poor oral intake. Uh, past medical history is negative, no recent travel exposures, no fever or rash. These are her labs. The most likely cause of her renal insufficiency is please notice her platelet count as you answer. So some of you thought hemolytic uremic syndrome, but her platelet count was normal here, right? So this is in fact probably acute dehydration. Um, let's contrast that with this case which is very similar, but now the platelet count's only 65,000. Um, what's the most likely cause of this renal insufficiency? And I'm not trying to waste our time with this. This is how they'll kind of try to trick you on the exam. You, they'll give you hints, and the low platelet count is a hint here. Look at that, 100%. <laughs> and you said it couldn't be done. A 16-year-old girl, recent vomiting and poor energy, no fever or rash, her past medical history is positive for urinary tract infection, is a younger child and recurrent sinusitis for the last few years. 
Her labs show a creatinine of 1.9 with a metabolic acidosis of UN of 18. She's got blood and protein and leukocyte esterase with polys, but no eosinophils on her urine. Most likely cause of her renal insufficiency is Wegner's, yes, yeah, sinusitis and uh, renal failure is uh, vasculitis like Wegner's. Let's talk about dialysis. Um, it, it's an acute intervention in renal failure uh, to remove uh, fluid and dangerous uh, solutes. There are essentially three different ways that we can provide dialysis support to our patients. Hemodialysis, where we access the bloodstream, we remove the blood up to about 10% of the blood, run it through a purifying cartridge and return that clean blood back into the bloodstream. We can do peritoneal dialysis, where instead of removing the blood and doing the uh, exchange in an external cartridge, we put fluid into the peritoneal lining and we use the blood vessels in the peritoneum uh, to uh, be our semipermeable membrane to remove things from the blood. And then finally, we have CVVH, which is also a blood dialysis, but instead of coming in with a machine and hooking them up for a few hours at a time, we continuously hook them up. It's a bit more uh, well tolerated uh, in terms of removing fluid, because if you have to remove two liters worth of fluid that the patient's getting over a 24-hour period, if you have to remove that two liters over a four-hour period, you're talking about moving a half a liter of blood per hour for four hours, as opposed to removing it over 24 hours, you can do it under a much more gentle uh, uh, way. Chronically, peritoneal dialysis, there are two main ways to do it. CAPD, or continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, uh, is a manual exchange of fluid. You hook up to a catheter that goes into your peritoneal cavity. You drain fluid out. You put in clean fluid and you disconnect. You go about your business for a couple of hours. You reconnect. You drain that fluid and add new fluid. You don't need any hardware. You can do it on your own. You can do it in the middle of nowhere without electricity. Worldwide, it is the most common way that peritoneal dialysis is done. Here in the United States, we like our machines and our toys, and so we do continuous cyclic peritoneal dialysis, uh, which is where patients hook up once right before they go to bed, and then as they sleep, there is a cycler that manually or that actually automatically puts fluid in and takes fluid out all night long. They get multiple exchanges overnight. The benefit of that is, is that they don't have to keep doing multiple hookups throughout the day. It's a single hookup, and you get dialysis throughout the night. PD in general is better tolerated by patients. Uh, there aren't as many fluid restrictions because they're dialyzing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As long as you keep fluid in their belly, they are dialyzing. Um, they can go to school uh, because they can dialyze with the fluid in their belly, and then they go home at night and they get their dialysis. Uh, but you do have to pay particular attention to the catheter. There are complications like infections um, and uh, catheter malfunctions. Uh, if you tug on the catheter enough, you can pull it out. Um, there are still restrictions. Dialysis is not an end-all and be-all. Uh, the quality of life for kids on dialysis is not nearly the same as for healthy kids. Uh, and they do get burnout from doing PD. This is something that is much more family intensive. They're in charge of the dialysis. They come in at a minimum of once a month to be evaluated. But it's really something that they're doing. And every night they've got to do their hookup. They can't take any nights off. They can't not do it. Uh, hemodialysis, acutely, again, they need a catheter for this. On a chronic nature, they can either have a tunneled catheter or a perm cath, or preferably either an AV fistula or an AV graft, uh, which is a connection between an artery and a vein. Uh, if you make that connection, the vein will then become arterialized or bigger and thicker. You can then stick that vein uh, to get blood out, and you can return blood back through that vein. We typically do hemodialysis on a chronic nature three days a week for four hours. There is more and more pediatric data that's coming out that perhaps doing more frequent, shorter dialysis is better. And so there are some units that are doing, instead of four hours three times a week, they're doing three hours four times a week. And although it's still 12 hours of dialysis a week, having more frequent dialysis sessions gives more stable uh, labs better growth, less buildup of toxins. Um, much more fluid and dietary restrictions for hemodialysis patients than PD patients. 
less parental effort. They just have to get the patient to the dialysis unit. Um, and we can uh, measure adequacy and maintain adequacy with dialysis. Obviously, there are complications with hemodialysis as well. Access problems either through the insertion, blocked, it doesn't function. Bleeding, because we often have to anticoagulate to keep the blood from clotting in the cartridge. Uh, and so three times a week or four times a week as these kids come in to get dialysis, their blood is external. We've anticoagulated them and they have bleeding. Infection is a major problem, particularly if they're dialyzing through a catheter instead of through a fistula. Uh, dialysis disequilibrium is a problem we see in acute kidney injury if we lower the BUN too quickly. Um, uh, and then post-dialysis fatigue. Some people after dialysis feel great. They've had their toxins removed and they're ready to go. Some people after dialysis feel like they've been running on a treadmill for the last four hours. And again, when you hook someone up to a dialysis machine, there is an additional 10% of the blood in circulation. And it is sort of like doing a stress test every time you hook someone up to a dialysis machine because there's extra blood in circulation that, has to, uh, that your heart has to, to keep pumping around. Um, no one is going to come into your office and complain of uremia. Um, what they will complain of is the symptoms of uremia. And again, we've got about an hour left, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to read through these. Um, but just know that there are a myriad of symptoms, and you can review this. All of these are here in your uh, uh, handout. What I will point out specifically before we move on is that notice that dialysis is not the treatment of choice for any of these complications. Really, dialysis is the treatment of last resort. Now, if they have CNS complications from uremia, right at the top there, yeah, that they need dialysis for because there's really no way to, to fix those. But if they have electrolyte problems, we can alter their diet. We can change their, uh, uh, their intake. If they have a metabolic acidosis, we can give them bicarbonate. We can neutralize that acid. Uh, if growth, uh, kids with renal failure often have growth delay. We can give them growth hormone uh, to get them to grow. If they're anemic, we can give them erythropoietin or, or an erythrocyte stimulating agent. Dialysis is really a therapy of last resort, not of first resort. Um, you should know the stages of chronic kidney disease. Uh, these came uh, from the National Kidney Foundation and from KDOKI, uh, which is the Dialysis Outcome Quality Initiative. Stage one kidney disease is normal function, but with some chronic kidney condition. Stage two is early uh, diminished function, 60 to 90. Uh, as you get more diminished from 60 down to 30, that's stage three CKD. Stage 4 CKD is a GFR uh, less than 30 but higher than 15. Stage 5 uh, GFR less than 15. There are lots of complications with chronic kidney disease. Um, increased mortality, Rulon Parekh, uh, 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 she was at Baltimore at the time, showed that uh, children on dialysis have a 1,000-fold increase of cardiovascular death compared to their age match peers. Uh, and so even though we do have dialysis and we can offer a life-sustaining therapy, uh, a uh, child on dialysis has the same life expectancy as an 80-year-old in the United States. Uh, so this is really a disease that causes a diminished uh, lifespan. And even if they're not dying from their chronic kidney disease, they have poor growth. Up to a third of patients uh, who are children on dialysis are less than the third percentile, for so growth failure is a major problem. Uh, diminished learning, seizures, poor nutrition because of the dietary restrictions, anemia, bone disease, heart disease, bleeding. And so the therapy of choice is to not keep them on dialysis, but to get them a new kidney. Um, and so renal transplantation is the therapy of choice. Uh, they do have better survival, better quality of life, better school and social interactions because they're not pulled out so often. Uh, but uh, we can do this preemptively in some conditions, often uh, we are unable to do a preemptive transplant because there just aren't enough kidney donors out there. Um, there are more technical issues in infants, and so it's very hard to transplant a kid who's under 10 or 15 kilos, um, both from a surgical, uh, they're mostly surgical complications. Just the, the sutures are so small, the vessels are so small, you can't, you can't do it. Teenagers, the major problem is non-adherence. Uh, teenagers will be teenagers, but it's not... Uh, it's not an accident that most pediatric kidneys fail around the teenage years because of noncompliance or non-adherence to medications. Uh, 
The most common etiology of chronic kidney disease is structural kidney disease, about 40% are what we call CACUT, uh, which is congenital anomalies of the kidney or urinary tract, C-U-K-I-T, whatever that is. Uh, and then glomerular disorders are the next uh, most common. There are two ways that we get, actually there are now three ways that we get kidneys. In the old days we used to talk about living, don well there's still living donors and uh, deceased donors, there's still only those two. But we used to talk about a living related transplant or a cadaveric transplant. More and more we're now seeing living unrelated transplants where altruistically someone is donating a kidney. And when I made that announcement earlier, you're not donating a kidney, it's just for bone marrow over there. Uh, but no, more and more people are donating kidneys uh, even to people who are not their relatives. There is a slight improvement in uh, overall outcome with living related transplants compared to cadaveric transplants. It's much less than it used to be since we have much better immunosuppressive medications. And the main thing that you get with a living related that you don't get with a uh, deceased is better matching. You're better matched to your relatives in terms of all the antigens that are on that kidney. The graft survival uh, is uh, a function of how many and how often you have rejection. Um, overall survival for your patient is not only rejection but also other complications, infections, graft uh, loss, surgical complications, vascular thromboses, and then long term, even after a kidney transplant, Patients are at a higher risk of atherosclerotic kidney, excuse me, atherosclerotic heart disease, infections because of the immunosuppression, increased malignancy because believe it or not, we do rely on our immune system to hunt down and fight cancer cells. And if you shut down the immune system, they are more likely to develop cancer and also complications of their medications. The mainstay of therapy in the United States, uh, in the old days it was just prednisone. Uh, these days, we have much more uh, powerful uh, immunosuppressive drugs, calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin was the classic. These days, I think more pediatric programs in the United States are using tacrolimus, again, less nephrotoxic than uh, cyclosporin. Mycophenolate is another medication in our program. Those are the three we use. Uh, we use tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisone. Uh, sirolimus is another uh, medication that's sometimes used. It's a uh, target of rapamycin inhibitor, uh, but it can potentiate chronic allograft nephropathy and can cause hyperlipidemia as well. For acute rejections, there are antibody therapies now, antithymocyte globulins and anti-IL-2 therapies. Uh, the different types of rejection that you need to be aware of, hyperacute is the one that happens right away. It's a humoral rejection from preformed antibodies that somehow got missed on the cross match. Your body already has those antibodies. I've put a kidney into you and instantly your antibodies start reacting to that kidney and you have a hyperacute rejection. Acute rejection can happen early on, you know, a week or so after a transplant and it can be either a vascular injury or a tubular injury. Um, and then chronic rejection is also vascular or tube. And we don't call it chronic rejection anymore because it was uh, depressing to say that they had chronic rejection. We now say that they have chronic allograft nephropathy, that their kidney is just starting to fail on them. About 95% of rejection can be stopped with uh, acute anti-rejection therapy, but the graft survival, as I mentioned, does go down with each bout of rejection that you have. A five-year-old with posterior urethral valves and advancing renal insufficiency, the decision has been made to start dialysis while a search for a transplant donor can be pursued. A defining principle in the decision about the best dialysis modality for this child is. Yeah, C. Thank you, it makes me feel like I'm doing something up here when everyone gets the right answer. A 16 year old girl with FSGS just underwent a living transplant last week. She's afebrile and eating well. Her urine output is diminished and although her creatinine got down to as low as one, it's now back up to 1.9 over the last two days. Her blood pressure is 122 over 68. Her UA has blood but otherwise negative. The most likely cause of her acute change in serum creatinine is, 
acute rejection. All right, so that's enough about dialysis and transplants. Um, let's talk about pregnancy. So we went from the depressing to the wonderful. Uh, there's actually not much on pediatrics that I need to say about pregnancy. It's a very short section. Um, Pregnancy-induced hypertension or preeclampsia is new onset hypertension in the third trimester that presents with proteinuria and edema. And so these kids, and I say kids because, you know, kids are now sometimes coming in with pregnancy. They do come to pediatric nephrology uh, with proteinuria and hypertension, and uh, it's a pregnancy-related complication. All you need to know about it for the board exams is that they can have DIC and thrombocytopenia and can develop the HELP syndrome. Uh, with chronic kidney disease, you can actually have a successful pregnancy. 90% uh, of patients with lupus are able to carry a pregnancy to term if their nephritis is in remission at the time that they, are, that they get pregnant. Um, the unfortunate thing is that if they have a flare during their pregnancy, there's about a 25% chance that they're going to lose the, the pregnancy. Um, before lupus patients get pregnant, you should screen them for lupus anticoagulants and for the SSB antibodies because they often need to, certainly need to go to high-risk pregnancy and they often put them on aspirin throughout pregnancy to prevent them from having clotting. Um, with other forms of CKD, if the creatinine is less than two milligrams per deciliter and their blood pressure is normal, they generally don't have any increased risk of abortion or fetal malformations, um, but they do have a risk of worsening renal disease. So the baby usually does okay, but it's a stress on moms to go through this. And so if people have chronic kidney disease, one of the things they need to be aware of is that they may flare their disease or that their disease may get worse during pregnancy. Um, and if they have a creatinine that's over two, um, first of all, it's less likely that they're going to get pregnant, although it is not a contraception. And so please don't know, just because your creatinine's high, you don't have to use contraception. It doesn't work like that. Um, but uh, uh, they are less likely to get pregnant. All right, I told you it was going to be short and sweet. All right, let's talk about renal stones and urinary tract infections. The last two sections, uh, 11 and 12, they're not the last two because I added a 13th section on fluids. But 11 and 12 are mostly urologic sections, but Tommy didn't want to hire a urologist to come talk to you, so he asked me to do it. So we're, I'm, I'm putting on my urologist hat. Uh, kidney stones, uh, uh, what normally prevents us from getting kidney stones is one, we don't have all that much calcium in our urine to start with, and two, we have citrate, and citrate is what prevents the uh, calcium from uh, crystallizing. The most common type of stones in pediatrics is calcium oxalate stones, followed by calcium phosphate stones, and these are in order, struvite, and then uric acid stones, and then finally cysteine stones. Um, in general, uh, the best way to prevent kidney stones is to give lots and lots of fluids um, because however much calcium is coming out or however little citrate is coming out, the more dilute the urine is, the less likely it is that they're going to start forming uh, those urinary crystals. Calcium oxalate stone uh, is due either to hypercalciuria or to hyperoxaluria. It's the most common, as I said, idiopathic form of kidney stones. Um, and uh, the treatment of uh, calcium oxalate stones is a normal calcium diet um, with a decrease in oxalate intake. Um, and, and a lot of people don't get this, and they say, oh, I had a kidney stone, and it was a calcium stone, so I'm going to really decrease my oral intake of calcium. Um, that's the wrong advice to give patients. And the reason is, is because what we eat has oxalate in it. And if you limit the calcium intake, then you're not going to form calcium oxalate in your intestines, and you're going to absorb even more of your oxalate. And so more of that oxalate is going to have to come out in your urine, which is going to increase your risk of having kidney stones. And so if you have calcium oxalate stones, eat a no now don't go crazy and eat more calcium than normal, but eat a normal calcium so that you bind that oxalate in the intestines uh, and it never even gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, calcium phosphate stones are common with distal RTA, um, we didn't really talk about that much when we were talking about RTA, but calcium stones and distal RTA, there's a big uh, association there. The alkaline urine promotes the calcium phosphate precipitation. Uh, there are some other causes of calcium phosphate stones, hyperparathyroidism, acetazolamide, or topramide, uh, topramate, excuse me. Uh, struvite stones are infection from urease, uh, from urea cleaving organisms. Uh, the classic one is proteus. 
Uh, so Proteus, which cleaves the uh, urig, leads to a high urine pH, and you get uh, struvite stones. You can also get it with pseudomonas yeast or staph infections. Uh, cystinuria leads to cysteine stones. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. And then finally, uric acid stones from hyperuricemia. You can get it idiopathically, or if you have tumor lysis or high tumor breakdown and you have high uric acid levels, it's also part of the Leshenium syndrome uh, to have those uric acid stones. How do we evaluate kidney stones? Again, in the old days, it used to be IVP, but nobody's using IVP really much anymore. We're using CT, which has the highest sensitivity, particularly if you get a helical CT. Renal ultrasound uh, might be a better screening test if your uh, index of suspicion is lower because it doesn't involve any radiation. However, you, it's not as sensitive. You may miss uh, smaller stones or stones that are down in the ureter. You don't pick up the ureter as well um, in a renal ultrasound. Uh, if you can capture a stone, you can do a stone analysis and figure out what it is. Is this a strubite stone? Is it a calcium oxalate stone? Is it a calcium phosphorus stone? Um, but often we never catch the stone. Um, we still do to give strainers and tell people to strain their urine and try to catch the stone. Um, but even if we catch the stone, we will often do urine studies. And the urine studies that we look at, we want to know urine volume, urine creatinine, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, what the sodium to potassium ratio is, how much oxalate, how much citrate, cysteine, the supersaturation indices. I can't even remember all of those things that we order. And I'll be honest with you, these days, most of us don't order these things individually from our local labs. We use mail-off services, and there are a couple of mail-off services. Uh, the one I use is called Litholink. It's here in San Antonio. Um, but there are a number of them, and I, I'm not you know, trying to advertise for them. But it, they're really nice for the patients. You, they, they mail the patients an entire jug, and the jug has a reagent in it. And the more you pee into it, the more dilute the reagent gets. And so you don't have to mail off the whole jug. They just pour a very little bit of that into a small jug or a small jar. They mail that off to the company. And then depending on how dilute it is, the company knows what the total volume of urine is. And then they can measure all of these things in there, and they give you a nice stone risk analysis. Uh, serum studies, obviously, we look for serum electrolytes. We look for calcium. Uh, phosphorus and magnesium with stones, BUN and creatinine, and then we do urinalysis and cultures, again, looking to see if they have struvite stones, if there's an infection going on. I mentioned this earlier. With calcium oxalate stone, normalize the calcium intake. Don't do a low calcium intake. Try to get them to onto a low sodium and a low uh, uh, protein diet. That's where the oxalate comes from, is from the high protein intake, and to avoid high oxalate intake. We can use potassium citrate or uracit K as a therapy to both increase urinary citrate and also to increase urinary potassium, which helps prevent the stones from forming. Calcium phosphorus stones, again, we don't try to limit their calcium intake. Uh, same thing, uh, citrate uh, orally. And this is one where we can give thiazides, which decreases uh, uh, calcium secretion. So you remember that Lasix leads to an increase in calcium in the urine. And so with hypercalcemia, we will give Lasix to have them pee off more calcium. If someone's having kidney stones, you can give them uh, thiazide diuretics, which decreases urinary calcium, and so you can decrease their stone risk. Struvite, you've got to prevent the urinary tract infection. If there's a stone there, you have to remove it. They often don't come out. Um, and then uric acid stones uh, decrease their protein intake, which is where the uric acid is coming from. You can also use allopurinol and then cysteine uh, alkalinize the urine. And then down at the bottom there, clearly you want to get their urine output up. You want a high urine volume uh, so that whatever they're getting uh, rid of is dilute and less likely to form stones. Surgical options. Most stones don't require surgery. 97, 99% of them will pass on their own. Um, push fluids, push narcotics, push NSAIDs. The indication for Admission to the hospital is if they're not able to tolerate oral fluids or if you can't manage their pain as an outpatient. Otherwise, you can send them home to drink and manage their pain. But if you need to admit them for IV fluids and pain management, um, you can do that. Removal, if they're obstructed, if there's a UPJ where the kidney and ureter are leaving the, uh, or where the ureter is leaving the kidney, or a UVJ where the ureter is entering the bladder, those are the most two common cases for obstruction. You'll need to, you need to remove those stones. You can remove them with uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Uh, 
You can do that for stones that are under a centimeter in size. If they're over a centimeter, you're probably not going to be able to bust them up with uh, shockwave lithotripsy. You may need to go in cystoscopically or even open surgery to remove those stones. Urinary tract infections, cystitis, pyelonephritis, and renal abscess. Um, the etiologies of urinary tract infection in pediatrics are E. coli, and then E. coli, and then E. coli, and then after E. coli, you get to the other things like Klebsiella, Proteus, and Enterocar. But really, 90% of the first UTI in childhood is generally uh, uh, E. coli. Um, as long as we're talking about ureth urinary tract infections, I'll mention acute uh, urethral syndrome, uh, which is uh, in girls often postcoital with staph or chlamydia or E. coli. It's not technically a urinary tract infection. It's a urethral infection, um, but uh, they will come in with that. The lifetime risk of urinary tract infections, we finally reached a disease where girls have it worse than boys. Girls, 30 to 50% of you will at some point develop a urinary tract infection. We men, 1%. And in childhood, so preteen, about 10% of girls will develop a urinary tract infection. Again, 1% of boys. Um, however, in the first three months of life, boys have it worse. 75% of uh, UTIs in the first few months are from boys. Um, much more so in uncircumcised boys. The risk factors are obstruction or urine stasis, anything that prevents the urine from freely getting out. Uh, so an anatomic obstruction like a UPJ obstruction, cysts in the kidneys, stones, tumors, an indwelling catheter is an increased risk, a mega ureter, neurogenic bladder. Um, clinically, neonates present with a urinary tract infection with fever, feeding abnormalities, diarrhea, failure to thrive, and a direct hyperbilirubinemia, which is exactly how neonates present with every illness that they have. So your index of suspicion has to be high because they can't tell you that they have dysuria and they often won't have blood in their diapers. Now kids over the age of two do start to have symptoms of urgency, of frequency, uh, of it hurts when I pee. They'll have back pain with pyelonephritis. With cystitis, there's usually not much in the way of fever. They just have burning when they urinate um, and uh, dysfunctional urination, so urgency or frequency or dribbling. Pyelonephritis or a kidney infection, they will present with fevers. They'll have back pain and they'll have nausea and vomiting as one of their presenting signs. Uh, diagnostically, a clean catch with greater than 100,000 colony forming units per mil is diagnostic. Uh, a catheterized specimen with greater than 10,000, don't ever send a bag specimen. So I'm not going to tell you how many bag specimens what you need. Um, and, and I say this and everyone knows this, but clinically, please, don't send bag UAs for cultures. They, they, they really confuse us nephrologists as to whether or not it was truly an infection or not. And often with recurrent infections, the number of infections that you had is an important determinant of whether we need to intervene or not. So you can put a bag on to get a UA, but if the UA looks dirty, please cat that kid to get a UA for a culture. Uh, pyuria is a UTI, but it can also be uh, urethritis, uh, renal or urinary tract inflammation, or nephritis, so not everything that has white cells in the urine is an infection. Um, and so don't just base a urinary tract infection on, well, they had white cells in their urine. That's not an infection. You've got to get bugs that grow. Leukocyte esterase and nitrites together are actually both sensitive and fairly specific for a urinary tract infection, but either one of them alone, not so much. So just having leukocyte esterase or just having nitrite not very specific for urinary tract infection. If you have both of them, it's much more specific. Imaging, a renal ultrasound. Um, this is one where I don't know necessarily what to tell you. The new recommendations, which came out a couple years ago, are everyone with a urinary tract infection should get an ultrasound to look for structural abnormalities in their kidneys. Um, but after that ultrasound, whether you do a VCUG or not really depends uh, you know, in the old days, we would get a VCUG on everybody, except for perhaps a school-aged girl. A school-aged girl with a first simple cystitis, we wouldn't. But these days, I think more and more people are not getting a VCUG unless the renal ultrasound is normal. So again, I don't know what to tell you for the board exams for that because it's relatively new that those recommendations have changed. Um, if you are looking for reflux, you can look not only for a VCUG or avoiding cystiurethrogram, 
but also for a nucleotide cystogram if you want to get the nuclear medicine. It's more sensitive for reflux than uh, a VCUG is. Uh, and then finally, nucleotide radio, uh, radionucleotide scans. So a DTPA or a MAG3. MAG3 is a functional study that looks both for filtration but also for obstruction. Um, and then a DMSA scan looks for renal scarring. Uh, DMSA binds to functioning nephron, and so you inject it, and you get a static picture of the kidney. And if you see filling defects, that's where there's a scar or de diminished uptake uh, in acute pyelonephritis. And then finally, CT or MRI if you're looking for the structure. Empiric treatment uh, after a UTI and then localized down to a more specific therapy once you have your culture back. Uh, in a child who's toxic or has inability to take oral medications, or who has pyelonephritis picture, fever, flank pain, et cetera, still treat them with IV antibiotics um, with or without hospitalization. A child with just cystitis now does not need intravenous antibiotics. You can treat them with oral medications. Uh, neonates, generally, AMP and GENT is the therapy of choice still. Uh, infants who are toxic, you start with IV but can switch to PO uh, a couple of weeks of ceftriaxone or one of the cephalosporins. Uh, again, a toxic child we're treating intravenously. A uh, good-looking child who has simple cystitis, Bactrim is usually our first uh, therapy of choice. Complications, bacteremia, about 2 to 5% of kids with urinary tract infection will get, or with pylo will get bacteremic. Uh, the relapse rate in childhood is fairly high, 25 to 40%, usually within a couple of weeks of therapy. Uh, sometimes that's the same infection that was never cleared. Sometimes it's another infection. And so, again, I don't know what to tell you about prophylactic antibiotics. This is one that is a changing field over the last year or so. What to do with a kid after they've had a urinary tract infection? Do you just observe them and follow them, or do you put them on prophylaxis? Depends on what their ultrasound shows, whether there are structural abnormalities, whether they have reflux, et cetera. An eight-year-old girl with a history of persistent microscopic hematuria and, and dysuria for a year has right-sided abdominal pain and vomiting. There's a family history of nephrolithiasis. After she passes the stone, her workup should include ninety percent. Yeah, look for stone factor forming. Uh, stones are very painful, and and. Some people say, oh, it was one stone, leave it, wait until you have a second stone. Um, if you've had one stone, you know you don't want to wait until the second one until you work up. Because if there is some underlying problem, uh, then we can often get them on therapy and prevent the stones from growing back. Um, all right, an eight-month-old girl presents to the emergency department with fussiness, low-grade fever, and gross hematuria. Before starting her on antibiotics, you would. This should be a gimme. Yeah, I want to single out the one person who said about the bag UA in culture. <laughs> All right, yeah, calf UA in culture before you start antibiotics. Um, this one, I'm sorry, we, we're in the interest of time, we're going to skip it anyways. I don't think you're going to get crystals on the exam, but it, it was supposed to have this section over with the answers blacked out until you get to answer, but uh, both in your handout and here, they give you the answers. So. The A column is those calcium oxalate stones. The D column, those are uric acid stones. Look at them. I don't think you're going to get the look of stones on your pediatric board exam, but again, they're classic looking. The C, uh, those uh, hexagonal stones or, or cysteine stones, so that's, what they, that's what the crystals look like. All right, uh, last section before we get to fluids and electrolytes are the urologic problems. Um, kidney and urologic abnormalities that you're going to get asked about. Uh, Reflux, which we've already sort of talked about a little bit, UPJ obstruction, ureteral duplication, a mega ureter and ureteroceles, uh, vesiculo-urethral reflux, ureterovesicular reflux, uh, is retrograde flow of urine from the bladder back up towards the kidney. We have five grades of reflux. The earliest grade uh, is when you get reflux into the lower half of the ureter only. Grade two is when you go into the upper half of the ureter. Grade three is when you start to fill the renal pelvis. Uh, 
Grade four is when the renal pelvis is full, and grade five is when not only is the renal pelvis full, but you get tortuosity of the ureter. Um, clinically, uh, uh, these are generally asymptomatic. Uh, it used to be that we diagnosed reflux after a bout of a urinary tract infection, but with ultrasounds being done uh, essentially daily on pregnant women, I say that facetiously, but with the more use of ultrasounds in pregnant women, we're finding these asymptomatically in kids who just have hydronephrosis, uh, both prenatally and then postnatally, we confirm it, we'll get a VCUG and find uh, reflux. What do you do about reflux? Usually, you don't need to do anything except for wait. 85% of grade one and two reflux is gonna resolve on its own by the time kids are school age or ready to enter school. And about 50% of even the higher grade refluxes will resolve on their own. Now the risk of just letting reflux stay is that you're gonna get renal damage. A lot of the renal damage actually probably occurred before you ever diagnosed uh, reflux. It's not that reflux is causing renal damage, it's that there was renal damage and so there's reflux and they came together. Uh, Treatment, if you are gonna treat it, if they continue to get urinary tract infections and even after you put them on prophylactic antibiotics, they continue to get urinary tract infections. If it's a kid with a multicystic dysplastic kidney and I told you they only have the one functioning kidney and about 30% of them will have reflux, that's a kid that you wanna protect that kidney as best you can. Surgical, it's a very easy surgery for the urologist to go and essentially what they do is they disconnect the ureter from the bladder and then they reconnect it in in a non-refluxing way. These days, there's even a simpler technique that they can use that's called deflux, where they go in cystoscopically and at the orifice where the ureter enters the bladder, they inject deflux, which is a collagen containing stuff that essentially causes a inflammatory reaction that causes swelling there that then blocks the reflux and prevents reflux. Um, usually what we do, as I said, is either watchful waiting with prophylactic or without prophylactic antibiotics and that's a question that is still being answered right now. The RIVER study is a randomized controlled trial of using uh, uh, antibiotics or not in kids with reflux and whether it makes any difference in long-term renal outcomes. All right, UPJ obstruction uh, is a junction uh, of the ureteropelvis, so the ureter and the pelvis of the kidney uh, obstruction. It can either be an intrinsic narrowing or an extrinsic compression. Uh, it's about one in five thousand, uh, excuse me, one in 500 kids. Uh, generally, clinically, these are asymptomatic. We're picking them up more and more now on ultrasound. We find hydronephrosis on a kid uh, because they had a prenatal uh, ultrasound or they had a postnatal <laughs> ultrasound or they had belly pain for some reason and came into the ER um, or they were driving by the emergency room and someone caught a CAT scan on them uh, as they went by. Um, uh, we generally don't do anything about the, oh, if they present clinically, they often get pain with high urine flow. So uh, we see this sometimes in teenagers who binge drink and then they get flank pain and we find out that they have a UPJ obstruction. Uh, uh, the diagnosis is made with a renal ultrasound. You can also get a diuretic uh, renal scan, a MAG3 scan. Um, you can see on these images, and I think they're in your uh, handout as well. I'm a few pages behind you. I haven't been turning now. In your handout as well, uh, you can see that there is uh, quite a bit of uh, hydronephrosis in both the right and the left kidney here. Um, this uh, is the diuretic phase of the scan. Normally you should see a nice decrease in the tracer, but in this case in both the left and the right kidney there is no clearance of tracer. There's clearly obstruction there. And then down at the bottom, uh, you see the post images after they've relieved the obstruction, there's no more hydronephrosis anymore. And I didn't show it, but had you repeated the, uh, the scan, you would see a rapid uptake of MAG3, but then also a rapid uh, 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 excretion of MAG3. Ureteral duplication is when you have uh, either with or without uh, reflux, a duplication of your ureter. Usually the upper, mole the upper pole moiety of your kidney will uh, insert inferiorly and will insert uh, uh, distally into the bladder. The lower pole will insert proximally. The incidence of duplication of the ureter is about one in 160 kids, so not even that uncommon. Clinically, it's asymptomatic, but they may present with some flank pain uh, 
you might feel a mass there, or they may have a urinary tract infection. Ultrasound may miss this. As I mentioned earlier, you don't see the ureters very well with ultrasound. Uh, and so a diuretic renal scan will show the urine coming down in two separate ureters. And MRIs and, and CTs are better at finding these two. If they're symptomatic, you can send them to your urologist to fix this, but normally we don't. Uh, mega ureter is a mega sized ureter. The definition, I didn't make these up, uh, larger than about seven millimeters. Uh, it's about 10% of the prenatal uropathy. They can be either refluxing or non refluxing. They can be either obstructed or non obstructed. They can be either primary or secondary. Now, primary mega ureter is very uncommon, one in 10,000 babies. Um, clinically, they're often asymptomatic, but you can again flank mass, flank pain, or urinary tract infection. You can diagnose them with a renal ultrasound with a mega ureter, usually so big you can see the ureter on ultrasound, a VCUG, a diuretic renal scan, IBPC, TMRI, basically all the things that we've talked about, you can see big ureters. Treatment, if they're symptomatic, uh, uh, you can surgerize them. All right, a two-year-old girl with an unremarkable past history and recurrent UTI undergoes a VCUG that documents bilateral grade three reflux. Her treatment at this time should be preventive antibiotics for the rest of childhood, preventive antibiotics with repeat VCUG in a few years, deflux procedure, surgical reimplantation, or a CT to better define her anatomy. Yeah, so preventative antibiotics with a repeat VCUG in a few years. Now, the reason that that was the right answer that you didn't have to think about too long is because just watching and waiting wasn't an option here. If that were an option, I honestly don't know what I would tell you these days. As a nephrologist, I still do use prophylactic antibiotics, but of course I see the sickest of the sick kids who've had multiple infections, et cetera. All right, ureterocele is a cystic dilatation of the ureter into the bladder, uh, and so you get an intravesicular submucosa ureter. So the ureter doesn't end at the bladder, but extends into the bladder. Uh, you can see it with a single, although it's more common in a duplicated uh, ureter, um, and it's more common with the upper pole of the duplication. Um, it can cause reflux, because if it's uh, protruding into the bladder, the bladder often doesn't seal off the reflux. It can also cause obstruction, because it can decrease the flow of urine out, and it can lead to urinary tract infections. Um, Again, females much more common than males, seven to one here, um, but again, not all that common. Clinically, they present with urinary tract infections or obstructions. Um, diagnosis, again, renal ultrasound, VCUG, diuretic renal scan. When you find the ureteroseal, if they're having infections, if they're symptomatic, uh, those need to be repaired. Um, and again, reflux with the ureteroseal is probably not going to get better. So the surgeons can fix both the ureteroseal and the reflux at the same time. All right, bladder abnormalities, neurogenic bladder, posterior urethral valves, which is really a urethral abnormality, prune belly syndrome, and then urethral prolapse. A neurogenic bladder is a neurologic dysfunction of the bladder that leads to abnormal functioning and poor emptying. Um, the uh, causes are myelomeningocele, CNS, uh, or spinal cord dysfunction, uh, spina bifida, things like that, or they can be isolated neurogenic bladder. Uh, clinically, they come in with incontinence, with urinary tract infection, with obstruction, with uh, big bladders, you know, distended bladders, uh, or they have obvious risk factors for a neurogenic bladder, and, and we, we pick them up. Um, you know, all of us who used the bathroom back in the break, uh, you know, did it probably without even thinking about what a miracle it was that we decided when we wanted to go to the bathroom. We were able to go to the bathroom, and when we had our pants down, we were able to relax our detrusor muscles and con our sphincter muscles and contract our detrusor muscles so that we could completely empty our bladder all at once and then close that off and let the thing start filling again. That's a fairly complex uh, uh, bit of neurologic uh, innovation in order to be continent. It's so impressive that newborns can't do it, right? They just, the pee comes right out. But as we grow up, we gain control of this. No, I mean, I say this as, as you know, in awe of the bladder because it really is something. Because as a nephrologist, hey, the kidneys won't work if the bladder isn't cycling all that well. Um, 
So let's talk about valves. We're down in the, the urethra. Um, this is a boy-only thing because boys have prostates and girls don't, and this is within the prostatic area of the urethra. There are two leaflets. Uh, there are not only two, but there are leaflets that uh, prevent the outflow of urine. Uh, this is a VCUG uh, that shows a very thick and uh, uh, dilated bladder with a thick, thick, thick proximal ureter, and then distal to the valves, you see a, a small, uh, excuse me, urethra. Um, clinically, uh, uh, these present, again, only in males. It's the most common cause of urinary tract obstruction in boys. It's about one in 5,000 boys. Clinically, urinary tract infections, incontinence obstruction, or bladder masses, also decreased urine flow. So you watch these kids pee, and it doesn't come out in a very strong stream. You can diagnose it with a VCUG. We often pick these kids up in utero because they have hydronephrosis before they're born. Uh, early treatment is put a catheter in instantly, put a catheter in, get the kid peeing aw right away, and then eventually you need urology to go in and fulgurate the valve to, to ablate the valve. If they're small kids, if they're premature, we try not to do anything in the, in the penis and, and in the urethra. And so instead, they'll do what's called a vesicosity, which is where they just open the bladder up to the skin and let the bladder drain out. As long as you relieve the obstruction, you're helping the kidneys. Um, and a baby's wearing a diaper anyways, whether they're peeing into a diaper from down below or peeing into a diaper for a vesicostomy. doesn't really make all that much of a difference. And then when they get bigger, you can correct the valves and close up the vesicostomy. Prune belly syndrome or Eaton-Lambert syndrome uh, is a congenital absence or deficiency of your abdominal muscles. Um, it is also much more common in boys, but unlike uh, uh, posterior urethral valves, this is possible to get in girls. About 5% of prune bellies are girls. The other 95% are in boys. Uh, one in 40,000. If it's severe, they can have oliguria and renal insufficiency. They get oligohydramnios because they're not making enough urine in utero. Uh, if it's mild, they can just get some bladder dysfunction where they have dysfunctional voiding. Um, urinary tract infections, but relatively normal renal function. Uh, clinically, bladder dysfunction, poor renal development with or without renal insufficiency, only about 20 to 30 percent of them will develop ESRD from this, but in that 20 to 30 percent, obviously, it's a major problem. Treatment with catheter drainage, with uh, intermittent catheterization, uh, uh, because I didn't mention when I was talking about the magic of our urinating, but we also need our abdominal muscles to help increase the abdominal pressure to help get that urine out. It's not just the bladder. The abdominal muscles help us as well. Uh, all right, a newborn with posterior valves had successful valve fulguration. What do you tell his parents about his long-term outcome? Yeah, most of you got B. His risk of childhood ESRD is still 20 to 30 percent. A 12-year-old boy with prune belly has never had his cryptorchism addressed. The most compelling reason to do a bilateral orcopexy is... All right, so most of you got uh, to bring his testes into place where he can be observed from a legacy. That's the right answer. For the 21% of you who said to preserve fertility, patients with prune belly are not fertile. That's part of the disorder. They're not going to have babies regardless. So you don't bring the testes down for fertility. That's a reason to do it for other kids. Getting the testes down will help them be fertile, but that won't help uh, patients with prune belly. But they have, if, if they have cryptorchism and the, the testes have been up for longer than two years, there's a greatly increased risk of uh, testicular cancer. So the reason to pull them down is so that you can screen for that. Right, urethral prolapse, more common in girls. Uh, it's where the urethra mucosa extends out through the external meatus. Um, it's most common in African-American school-age girls. Um, it's induced by increasing pressure, so coughing or constipation or trauma. Uh, you diagnose it just visually. You see the urethra prolapsing out. Um, treatment, you can reduce it manually, but they will generally require surgery to fix this because it will keep popping back out. All right, let's talk about the penis for a while. So penile abnormalities, uh, hypospadias, phimosis and paraphimosis, microphallus and priapism. 
Hypospadias is about 1 in 300 males. It's where the urethral meatus occurs not at the tip of the glands like it's supposed to, but on the underside uh, of the, the penis. Um, they may also have a cordy. Uh, this is, uh, and what comes up on the board exams for this, is this is a contraindication to circumcision. Um, the urologist is likely going to need that foreskin in his or her repair of the penis. So there's a picture of, the, of this in your, in your handout. But again, if you see a kid who's got hypospadias, and you should always look for hypospadias before you do the circumcision because they'll need that tissue. Um, it's most commonly isolated. You don't need to do a major genitourinary workup if it's just hypospadias. If they have other associated abnormalities, go ahead and do a renal ultrasound and a VCG to make sure that that's the only problem that they have. And we try to fix them before age two uh, just because it helps with continence and it helps with uh, uh, psychosocial uh, behavioral issues. Um, again, here's a picture of the hypospadias. This kid has his meatus way down here at the uh, bottom of his penis. They can close that up and use the foreskin to create a shaft for uh, his urine to come out near the end. Um, if you don't correct this, uh, it has fertility issues for boys as they get older. It's very hard to uh, uh, successfully impregnate when uh, the semen isn't coming out at the tip of the gland. All right, penile abnormalities, phimosis and paraphimosis. Uh, Phimosis is when you are unable to retract the foreskin. The most common is because you've forcefully retracted the foreskin a few times before, and then it will scar down, and so uh, the glands is trapped beneath the foreskin, and you can't retract it. A paraphimosis is the opposite of that. You also can't retract it, but then this time the glands is stuck outside, uh, and it's uh, unable to be retracted over. Um, if you have paraphimosis, because you uh, have a tight fissure and the glands is stuck on the outside, you need to get that repaired fairly quickly or you can necros the, the tip of the penis. Uh, all right, a microphallus uh, defined as a stretched penile length of less than two and a half centimeters. Um, isolated, this is due to uh, decreased gonadotropin release, um, uh, but it can also be associated, and this is where they come on the, on the board exams, prater willi syndrome, Kalman syndrome, and panhypopituitarism. Those are the syndromes that often present with microphallus. And then finally, priapism, a painful, unremitting erection where you have a rigid corpus cavernosum, but the uh, spongiosum is actually not uh, rigid. Uh, we see this in sickle cell disease. It's an uh, erection that lasts for more than four hours. We make jokes about this with Viagra now, but this is actually a fairly uh, painful and serious condition, and it can lead to impotence. Um, and it's often, as I said, in sickle cell for the patient's sickle in the, in the penis. All right, testicle and scrotal abnormalities, testicular torsion, testicular appendage torsion, cryptorchism, and then uh, uh, hernias and uh, hydroceles. Testicular torsion, again, shows up on exams, shows up in your offices. Uh, one in 4,000 males between uh, 3 and 20 years old. As you might imagine, girls don't have this problem. Um, it's an acute onset of pain, vomiting with scrotal edema, with redness and loss of that cremasteric muscle reflex. Uh, after 24 hours, if you don't fix this, uh, the necrosis is generally universal. So this is a surgical emergency for the urology colleagues. Um, you can get a Doppler ultrasound to see the diminished blood flow. And the reason to do that is because testicular appendage torsion is actually more common than, ac than testicular torsion. It's the most common cause of acute scrotal pain. And if you look at their ultrasounds, they actually have normal blood flow. Uh, and so they don't have as much acute symptoms, not as much pain, not as much vomiting. And those resolve spontaneously. So you don't want to send a kid to the OR to have his testicle untorsed if the testicle is not in fact torsed, but just the appendage torsion. So that's where we use ultrasound to look at the blood flow there. Cryptorchidism is the most common genital problem in newborn males. The high-riding testicles are testicles that don't come down into the scrotal sac. It's about a third of premature boys, 3 to 4 percent of term newborns. Uh, but by one year old, only about 0.3 percent have undescended testicles still. Um, they can be intra-abdominal or all the way up in the inguinal canal. Um, they can be retractive, which is they're actually down, but they retract high from a, a hyperactive premasteric reflex. Um, it's always associated with an inguinal hernia. If you have a retracted testicle or cryptorchism, you also have an inguinal hernia there. Um, that's how they got up there. If it's intra-abdominal, then torsion of that testicle is more likely. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, 
an undescended testicle has a much higher increased risk of cancer. So you want to try to pull those down. But before you pull those down surgically, you pull those down with HCG. And about 40% of the kids with uh, cryptorchidism will respond to uh, parenteral HCG administration. Um, if you've done that and it's been two years and the kid's two years old and they haven't responded, then you do get your urology colleagues to, to go ahead and pull those testicles down. All right, hernias and hydroceles, the inguinal bulge or scrotal mass is failure of the fusion or an obliteration of that process vaginalis. The hernia repair, uh, uh, non-commuting hydrocephalus, they usually resolve. And so hernias need to be repaired, hydroceles uh, don't. Uh, and then varicoceles is an abdominal dilatation or tortuosity of the vein of the testicle. Uh, it's asymptomatic. About 15% of adolescent males will have this uh, varicocele. Um, it may correct when you find it or you can observe it, but if the testes stops growing, uh, then it may need to be uh, addressed. All right, a 12-month-old boy has absent right testicle on exam. It's otherwise normal. The next step in management is... Yep, HCG is your first step. You don't need to do uh, anything else first. Uh, see if he'll respond to a trial of HCG. Ten-year-old boy has acute onset of right-sided scrotal pain. The most common cause of acute scrotal pain at this age is... actually the testicular uh, appendage torsion. That's more common than testicular torsion. All right, and then finally, voiding disorders, incontinence, diurnal enuresis, and nocturnal enuresis. Uh, nocturnal enuresis is an involuntary loss of urine during sleep. It's commonly familial in kids. Uh, so parents who had late uh, dryness at night are likely to have kids who are also late and dry at the night. It's twice as common in boys than in girls. Um, Although in teenagers over the age of 12, there's actually an equal incidence. It can be primary, which is they were never dry at night or secondary. Um, and then diurnal, they can have wetness throughout the day and night, or they can be dry during the day and only wet at night. The factors are a small bladder capacity, an excessive amount of urine that's being made during sleep, problems with sleep arousal, they're just really sound sleepers, or finally an uninhibited detrusal contraction. So the to trust our muscle is contracting. We evaluate this with a history, with a physical. We look for a history of urinary tract infections, family and psychosocial issues, and urinalyses. Treatment, time. Usually this gets better with age. You can use bedwetting alarms, measure bladder capacity. You can use medications like amipamine or DV AVP, although usually those are medications of last resort. Bladder capacity and emptying, we already gave of our odes to the bladder. So we'll very quickly go through about normal micturition and all the things that it requires. Daytime dryness usually precedes nighttime dryness. We get control of this when we're awake before we get control of this when we're asleep. By four or five, most kids do have bladder control when they're awake. Uh, bladder dysfunction can either be a capacity issue, an emptying issue, or both. Dysfunctional voiding is when you have incomplete relaxing or an overactivity of the pelvic floor. It's associated with abnormal bowel function. So these kids who have bladder problems also have uh, uh, bowel, bowel constipation as well. Um, uh, dysfunctional elimination. They can have recurrent UTIs if they're not emptying their bladder fully. Clinically incontinence, frequency, urgency, dysuria. And it can actually lead to hydronephrosis and reflux and recurrent renal uh, problems. Incontinence can either be leakage, an ectopic ureter. I had a patient whose ureter attached not into the bladder but into her vagina. And we never knew this when she was a baby because she was in diapers, but she got out of diapers but continued to just kind of slowly dribble and leak into her diaper. And when we evaluated her, her ureter emptied straight into her vagina. That has to be surgically corrected so that she can be dry. And when they put it into the bladder, she was fine. Voiding without prior awareness if there's a sensory defect in the bladder uh, or the uh, detrusor instability, what's called the curtsy sign. Attention to signs of nerve or spinal problems. Assess for daytime uh, incontinence. Get a renal ultrasound. If it's just nighttime uh, or if the kids gets too old, go ahead and do urodynamic. It's a great study. I don't do them. The urologists do. But they actually can measure bladder capacity and bladder pressures and 
uh, volume of uh, capacity and stream and all those things. Uh, treatment depends on their underlying cause. All right, case four, girl with UTIs, develop urgency with daily incontinence and new onset nocturnal enuresis after having been dry at night for over a year. Her signs of dysfunction avoiding may be secondary to all of the following except Hmm, kind of all over the place. She's dry during the day, so it's only at night. Uh, so again, excessive fluid intake was the, the answer there. All right, last one. Uh, I think this is the last one. If an eight-year-old girl presents with persistent nocturnal enuresis, no history of UTI or daytime incontinence, the factors that may account for her persistent nocturnal enuresis include all except. So why is she not having nocturnal enuresis? Yeah, spinal cord injury. That's not a 12-hour-a-day thing. Spinal cord injuries would be a 24-hour-a-day thing. All of the rest of those could be nocturnal enuresis. All right, I've got about 10 minutes left, so I want to very briefly go through some fluid and electrolyte stuff. So a 15-month-old girl, and we only have 10 minutes, so I'm actually going to go fast. A 15-month-old girl is well hydrated, is going to be coming in for a surgical procedure. What should you write her IV fluids to be? And again, practicing docs here, think about what would you write for a kid who's 16 kilos. This gets back to our concept of maintenance fluids. Um, and I put maintenance in air quotes because maintenance is for a healthy child who's NPO. It's not necessary for the kids that we're admitting to our hospitals anymore. Um, but the amount of fluid requirement is based on our caloric requirements, right? How many calories are we burning? because it's the calories that we burn that determine how much fluid we need. The nice thing about it is, is that for every 100 kilocalories we burn, we need 100 cc's of fluid. So it, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. But the amount of calories that we burn is dependent on our body size, right? Smaller we are, the higher body surface area we have to our weight, the higher our metabolic demands are. And so a kid under 10 kilos, each of those kilos has to stay warm-blooded, and we are warm-blooded animals, and it takes a pretty high amount of energy to keep us warm-blooded. So a five-kilo kid by his weight has a much higher metabolic demand per kilo than I do, and if I were to go out and gain an extra five kilos, my metabolic demand would really not go up that much more. Um, and so for those first 10 kilos, you need 100 kilocalories per kilo in terms of your body expenditure, for the next 10 kilos, between 11 and 20 kilos, it's only 50 kilocalories per kilo. And for each kilo over 20, it's 20 kilocalories per kilo. So that's the 150-20 rule that you guys, or maybe it's the 4 to one rule that you guys uh, have learned. Um, and again, it's a one-to-one. -one, so for every kilocalorie, you need a cc. So you can also think of it as cc's of fluid. Um, and so uh, 100 per kilo per day, uh, 50 for the next and then uh, 20 for the next. Special cases that you need to think about when coming up with fluids. Insensible losses, everything but urine is only about 30 or 40 percent. So in kids with renal failure who are not peeing, they don't need quote unquote maintenance fluids. They only need about a third of maintenance fluid. Kids who are on a ventilator also don't need maintenance fluids because one of our insensible losses is through breathing. If you go out on a cold day and go, oh, you'll see that breath, or if you breathe into a mirror, you'll see that we're losing fluid through our breathing. But if I put you on a ventilator, that's humidified air, and so your fluid requirements goes down. And then we need to adjust it based on our ADHD, excuse me, on our ADH. I'm a little ADHD. Uh, 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 things that increase your ADH secretion are myriad, and again, they're listed in your syllabus, hypovolemia, hypotension, medications, pain, stress, and of course, SIADH. Uh, the solute requirements, how much fluid is based on caloric needs. The solute requirement is really based on the number of calories that you're burning. And so uh, surface area method and then body weight method. I prefer the body weight method because it's easier. easier. Uh, and this, the body weight method is not based on kilocalories. The body method is based on the fluid requirements. So for every 100 milliliters of fluid, 
that you're receiving, you need about three mil equivalents. And the reason is because if you do it on a per kilo, it ends up, you know, for the under 10 kilo kids, you're fine. But as you get higher, you'll start giving them too much sodium or too much potassium. Um, but so the body weight, about three mil equivalents per 100 cc's of fluid for sodium, about two for potassium, and about three for chloride. We don't generally think about chloride because when we give uh, sodium, we give chloride as well. So back to that, six, that 15 month old who was 16 kilos, uh, these are your choices for fluids. Uh, what would you put her on? Most of you would use uh, D5 half normal saline at 52 an hour. So you got the 52 an hour. And if you do the 421 calculation, that is the maintenance requirement for her. I would agree. I would probably do the same thing. I would put the kid on half normal saline. But on an exam, if you have the choice, if you do the calculation, the right answer is actually third normal saline. We use half normal because they don't have standard third normal saline. Um, and I don't know that they'll trick you like that on the boards or not. But if you do the calculations, people need third normal saline. For about the last 20 years, we've come up with what's called the rapid replacement method. Um, this is the standard that I think we all probably practice where we give a kid a 20 per kilo bolus of normal saline if they need fluid, and then we subtract that off of the total amount of fluid that they need. Um, and so it's best for the usually dehydrated patient you rapidly expand either 10 or 20 mils per kilo, and then you follow that by the final restoration, and you do the calculations both from dehydration and maintenance needs, how much do they need. Um, and so, again, there's the 421 rule for the maintenance requirement. Um, we usually use D5 half normal most frequently. Uh, uh, and, again, for the basic metabolic demands, as I said, for most of us, it's actually D5 third normal that we need but we generally bump it up. And then finally, uh, uh, 20 of K per liter is the, the standard. Hyponatremic dehydration, a girl that's six years old, 30 kilos, presents to the ER with a several day history of vomiting and diarrhea, lethargic and pale, low BP, sodium is 114. What is her fluid replacement by the rapid replacement method? And I know you can't calculate these in eight seconds. I apologize. Eight or ten of you actually tried to do it. I'm impressed. Um, so a lot of you put C, normal saline. That's actually too much saline. Um, you don't want to bring her sodium up too quickly. And again, sit down and do the calculations. The, the answer here is D5, half normal. When you figure out how much sodium she needs in a day and how much fluid she needs in a day, given how severely dehydrated she is, Using the rapid replacement method, you would hydrate her at two and a half times maintenance. Um, and again, how do we figure out how dehydrated someone is? In infants, mild is 5%, moderate is 10%, severe is 15%. Older kids and adults, we're a little bit uh, less able to tolerate it, so we're severe dehydration and even less. Um, these are the findings, general appearance, skin turgor, mucous membranes, eyes, tears, skin color, urine output. With mild dehydration, you only have a few of these symptoms, maybe some mild decrease in activity, some skin turgor. With moderate dehydration, you have even more. And with severe hydration, you have a lot of these signs, plus you have abnormal perfusion and abnormal sens sensorium. Dehydration in pediatrics is almost always isotonic dehydration, uh, or isonatremic, rather. Um, Hyponatremic is about 1 to 2 percent. Hypernatremic is much rarer. That's not true on the board exams. That's actually true in clinical practice. On the board exams, they'll ask you about all three. Uh, tenting is more common uh, with moderate to severe dehydration. Uh, doughy skin is the hypernatremic. That's the catch word that they use for hypernatremic dehydration. It's because you have a relative retention of fluid in your extracellular fluid uh, as opposed to your intracellular fluid. Uh, the rate of replacement of deficiency, if it's isonatremic, or rather uh, uh, isonatremic dehydration, you can replace all of that over 24 hours. If they're hyponatremic, you want to replace all of the volume over 24 hours, um, but you want to replace the sodium at a rate that you're not going to uh, uh, increase their serum sodium by more than about 12 milliequivalents per day. And the same is true for hypernatremic dehydration. You don't want to decrease the sodium by more than about 12 milliequivalents per day, 
But in this case, you don't want to replace all of the deficit in 24 hours. You actually replace half of it in 24 hours and then half of it over the next 24 hours. So hypernatremic, uh, you are both replacing the, you're getting the sodium down slowly and you're replacing uh, the free water slowly. Um, the box plots for that kids that I showed you, again, you have these slides and we're right at noon, so I'm going to try to finish up here. Uh, you figure out that the kid needs 2.7 liters, 360 milliequivalents of sodium, and 80 milliequivalents of potassium. And if you divide those out, what you find out is that for the total day, when you do maintenance and deficit, the kid needs 4.5 liters with 400 milliequivalents of sodium and 115 of potassium. And so if you calculate that out, uh, it ends up being uh, D5 half normal or D5 normal. Most of us would give D5 normal and observe. Um, but again, what it is is 96 of, uh, excuse me, 115 of sodium and 96 of potassium. All right, ongoing losses from diarrhea, from vomiting, from nasogastric drainage. Tables are available to tell you how much different losses come from different body organs. Um, and the, the quick and dirty for hypernatremia, you give about four cc's of water for each milliequivalent of sodium that you want uh, to get down per, so four mils per kilo for each milliequivalent. So if someone's, so if you want to change someone's serum sodium by five milliequivalents per liter, you multiply five times their weight times in kilos times four, and that's how you get, uh, get to that. And so here's that question. A four-year-old girl presents with intermittent seizures and jitteriness, lethargic. She weighs 15 kilos. Her stat sodium is 112. You want to increase her sodium by five milliequivalents. So how much sodium does she need? Again, I didn't give you much time for the calculation. I apologize. The answer, if you do the math, and, and this is one that's in your syllabus. It's a question, of, uh, and it walks through the math for you, and it's 45 mil equivalent. Um, all right, special deficits, and again, I know I'm over time. I apologize. Hyponatremia, um, you do those calculations. Uh, and then the last thing that I will say, oral rehydration really is making a comeback in the United States. We don't use a lot of it, not because it doesn't work, it actually works really well. There have been studies both in the United States and Panama that shows that for moderate uh, or mild dehydration, it is equivalent to IV. We don't use it as much because we don't get paid for it as much. If we admit a kid to the hospital and orally rehydrate them, the insurance companies don't like that. Um, but it, it's true. But it works just as well. And the new oral rehydration is pretty close to half normal saline. It's got 75 mil equivalents of uh, sodium, it's got 20 of potassium per liter, it's got chloride, it's got citrate, it's got a glucose, uh, and it's relatively hypoosmolar. Uh, anyhow, I think that's my last slide. So again, oral rehydration, you give 50 mils per kilo over four hours, and the only thing you need to know about oral rehydration is you have to evaluate if it's working. If you're trying to orally rehydrate a kid and he keeps throwing up or she keeps throwing up, you have to abandon it and switch to IV. All right, that was all I had for you. I'm sorry I went over by a few minutes. <laughs>